All right, before we go through the discussion of physiology, which is going to take two days because physiology does get a little complicated. Not, it's not hard, but it's going to take us a few times of going through it, saying it over and over and over again, and then generally it kind of clicks after we've said it and done it together a few times. But before we go over the physiology, let's review our anatomy, know the different parts. Okay, so if we look at this overall picture, we can follow our airflow starting with the nasal cavity. What happens to our air we breathe in inside of the nasal cavity? Warms, moistened, and clean. Very good. Okay. Structures in the nasal cavity portion. Then we have the little fold, which are little flaps of tissue called concha. That allows the air to flow over a larger surface area so we can really clean it, really moisten it. When our air leaves the nasal cavity, it enters the pharynx. We have the nasopharynx, oropharynx, then the laryngopharynx, named simply by the region where they're located. After the air leaves the pharynx, because we're talking about air, epiglottis is up, the air goes through the larynx. The larynx is covered with irregular, large-shaped pieces of cartilage, Okay, main one being the thyroid cartilage, the Adam's apple in the front. Okay. What are the two important things that the larynx does for us? No, that's okay. That's sort of the answer. Okay. Right, so we have the epiglottis, so the larynx helps make sure that our air travels the way it's supposed to go, makes the food go the other way. What's the other thing the larynx does for us? Your voice production. That is where we have the little fold, the vocal folds, the little pieces of tissue that as the air rushes over them, that allows us to produce sounds. Okay? The more forceful the air goes, the louder the sound is, things like that. Okay? All right, after the larynx, our air goes through our trachea. How do we identify the trachea? Perfect concentric rings of cartilage. Why do we have all of those rings on the trachea? Why is that cartilage there? To, to make sure it never collapses. We want it to stay open all the time. Okay? Once the trachea gets to the chest cavity, it branches, and the two portions called the bronchi each go into a lung. All your lung is is a giant balloon that wraps around the bronchi. Okay? The lung is just a house that allows us to have pressure change. Pressure inside of the lung is different than outside, how that relates to the pressure inside of the bronchi. So all those lungs are going to be just a big balloon wrapped around the bronchial tree. Okay? So let's flip to another picture and get a little more details about what I'm fixing to say. Okay? Now that we're looking at our bronchial tree, okay, sorry it's so light, I don't know why. This would be primary bronchi, right? Starts branching, so this would be a secondary bronchi. Branches again, tertiary bronchi. Then we have a whole large network of bronchioles. As we get to the very end of the bronchial tree, we have a terminal bronchiole, then a respiratory bronchiole. On each respiratory bronchiole are hundreds of little grape-like clusters called alveoli. Why are the alveoli important? That is where gas exchange happens. That is where we move oxygen and CO2 across the membrane. So this is actually a much better picture of the terminal bronchiole, respiratory bronchiole, and alveoli because it shows you all of the capillaries wrapped around the alveoli. At this point, this is where oxygen that has been pulled into the lungs is going to cross across the respiratory membrane, go into the blood. CO2 that our blood has been picking up from tissues out in the body is going to leave the blood, cross the respiratory membrane, go into the lungs. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about how the oxygen knows to go which way and the CO2 knows to go which way and things like that here in just a second. Okay? Does everybody understand this anatomy we've gone over so far? Okay. All right. So now 
if we're ready to start looking at physiology, we got to understand there are pretty much three distinct parts of the respiratory physiology we need to talk about. Okay? The very first part of respiratory physiology is pulmonary ventilation. Pulmonary means what? Lung. Anytime you see pulmonary, you should immediately think lungs. Okay? Lung ventilation, when you ventilate, putting air in it, right? So pulmonary ventilation is going to simply be putting the air into the lungs and getting air out of the lungs. This has absolutely nothing to do with deciding which gas we use. This is simply how do we get a large amount of air in, how do we get a large amount of air out. Okay? Because do we just breathe in oxygen? No. We breathe in oxygen. We breathe in CO2. We breathe in sulfur. We breathe in hydrogen gas. There are tons of gases in the atmosphere that we breathe in. Okay? So what we're talking about now is simply how do we get all of that in and all of it out. Okay? In order to do this and understand this busy terms, each of the terms is going to be a different pressure. So they're always abbreviated with a, a capital P. That means pressure. And then the little subscript, that means you know the little letters written kind of below, is going to tell us what pressure we're talking about. Okay, there's going to be, there are several. A few we're not going to worry about too much right now. But for our purposes, we're going to have to keep up with two of them. And what two, now, the first one that's important to us is the PATM. That is the atmospheric pressure. Okay? The atmospheric pressure is the pressure outside of your body at all times. Okay? Atmospheric pressure at sea level, it does change some, but it's generally 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay? I don't care if you remember, remember that number. The reason I put it on here is because whenever you're looking at these figures in your textbook, I don't want you to see that MMHG and wonder what the heck is that. That's just a unit of measure. Just like we say it is 25 degrees Celsius in this room. Degrees Celsius is just how we measure temperature. Okay? Millimeters of mercury, that's just how we measure pressure. Okay? We're not worried about what the number is. We're going to worry about how things are in relation to atmospheric pressure. Meaning, when we look inside of our lungs, if that pressure is lower than atmospheric pressure, we're going to say it's negative. If the pressure inside of our body is higher than atmospheric pressure, we're going to say it's positive. It's greater. So we're not really going to be looking at numbers. We're going to be looking at, okay, if atmospheric pressure is this way, is it higher than that or lower than that inside of our body? Okay? Now, while I'm at that's when people kind of start drifting off. Well, let me give you the best example I can think of as to why this matters. Okay? Your lungs are like a big tire inside of your body. Okay? We all know we put air in our tires, right? Even the ladies know we put air in the tire, right? What happens to your tire if you jab a hole in it? The air comes rushing out. Okay? you lose the pressure in your tire. The reason there is a pressure in there is because you have forced more air in there than there is in the atmosphere. And when you jab a hole in it and the air starts rushing out of your tire, it's equalizing to atmospheric pressure. Okay? Tire goes flat. So guess what would happen to your lung if you jab something into your lung? your lung will deflate just like your tire would because the pressure inside of it is very analogous to what's going on in your tire. You have to maintain all these pressures just right or your lung will deflate. Okay, so I'm just trying to give you a reason of why we're talking about pressure. Pressure, that's the pressure in the atmosphere, always there. Is it always constant? Not 100%, but for the purposes of what we're talking about, we're going to assume, yes, atmospheric pressure is what it is. Atmospheric pressure is going to change. But if we're saying we're just in this classroom and we're having this discussion, atmospheric pressure is always going to be the same. Okay? The other important pressure that we have to keep up with is the intrapulmonary pressure. It's abbreviated P, little p u l. What does intrapulmonary mean? Inside the lungs. Okay, so this is going to be the pressure inside of the lungs. So we said the lungs were a big balloon wrapped around the bronchial tree. So we're saying this is the pressure inside of the balloon. It turns out 
that the pressure inside of the balloon is always equal to the pressure inside of the alveoli. Okay? So we're talking about the pressure inside of your alveoli. This is the one that we are going to change as we breathe in and out. Okay? Because in order to get a large amount of air to go in our lungs or out of our lungs, whichever way we're talking about, we've got to have this pressure either be more than or less than atmospheric pressure. Now, what, we, what our lungs are constantly trying to do is equalize with the atmosphere. Okay? It's okay for our pulmonary pressure to equal our atmospheric pressure as long as one other pressure, which this one's not going to change, but we need to know what it is, the intrapleural pressure always is maintained. So as long as the intrapleural pressure is negative, we're good. So our, our example I gave you where if you jab something in your side, your lung would deflate. That's not just because you pop your lung. What membrane would I go through if I stab myself with a knife? The pleural membrane. Where would the intrapleural pressure be? Outside the lungs in the pleural cavity. So by having that a little negative, that allows us to keep our balloons, our lungs, blown up. And we can change the pressure in them so they can go bigger. Okay? Now, I know we haven't really talked about how it happens, but does everybody understand these pressures? Now, you guys can read this, but let me show you some pictures make sure we understand. I don't know why it's so light. That's driving me crazy. Can you guys still see the projection? All right, so if we're talking about this is a person and they're going to breathe, okay, we've got to worry about what the pressure is outside of the body, and that's the pressure all around the person, okay? The, we're worried about air coming in, or in, you know, which we're talking about inspiring and expiring. The air inside of this region is the P pull, pulmonary pressure. Okay? The pressure between the thoracic cage right here and the wall of the lungs, this is the PIP intrapleural pressure. Okay? So everybody sees the difference. PIP always has to stay negative. Atmospheric pressure is constant, so we have to worry about one thing. Is our pulmonary pressure, the pressure inside of the lungs, okay, is that positive or is it negative? Either the atmospheric pressure, if it's negative, it's lower than atmospheric pressure. Okay? Everybody understand what I just said? Can I say it one more time? I can say it very similar, not the same way. Okay? But so PIP, intrapleural pressure, pressure between the lungs and the rib cage in the cavity, always negative. That is there to keep our lungs blown up. Okay? We don't worry about it changing. Atmospheric pressure, pressure outside the body, stays constant. So we are worried about the P pull, the pulmonary pressure, pressure inside of the lungs changing. If the pressure inside of the lungs is lower than atmospheric pressure, it's negative. If the pressure inside the lungs is higher than atmospheric pressure, it's a positive. Okay? So we're good? All right. Okay. Yes. So what she's asking about is when you're diving. Yeah, when you're scuba diving, they don't just give you a mask with just oxygen. That's not what they do to you. If you're going to scuba dive, you actually, you actually get a different mixture of gases than you would outside because you have to maintain pressures. It can kill you if you come up too fast because as you go down, it changes the pressure on your lungs. That's exactly what's going on. Okay. All right, so now we're finally ready to look at how we do our pulmonary ventilation. We got our definitions. We're going to talk about how we get the air in, how we get the air out. Okay. It turns out that we can relate volume changes to pressure changes. Now, how is volume going to come into play? Do our lungs change size when we breathe? Yes. Put your hands on your chest. Breathe in. What do your lungs do? Your chest gets big because your lungs are physically getting bigger when you pull all that air into your body. Okay? Well, we've got to know how they change in relation to each other. 
And it turns out somebody figured that out for us a long time ago, and his last name was Boyle. Okay? Now, how many of you have seen this equation? It may have been in high school, but we're not going to work these problems. I just want to know. How many of you have seen PV equals NRT? I can remember that. That was horrific. We worked problems for about three months in high school with that one equation. Okay? Well, that's kind of what we're using, but we're not doing the, like working problems. We're just going to figure it out when they developed that equation. Okay? So the first guy, Boyle, he figured out how the P and the V relate to each other. Okay? And mathematically, since the P and the V are by each other in the equation, that means they're inversely proportional. Inverse, what does that mean? They're opposite. Okay? So it turns out, and it's written on the slide, but I'm going to abbreviate it the way I'm going to abbreviate the rest of the class. If we increase the volume of something, of anything on Earth, not just lungs, but anything on Earth, what's going to happen to the pressure? It's going to decrease each other. Anytime you have a volume go up, you have a pressure go down. Anytime, so let's do it a different way. Let's say we didn't change the volume. Let's say, what if we increase the pressure? What's going to happen to our volume? Volume's going to go down. Okay? So you see, it doesn't matter which one you change. The other one's always going to respond to it. And they're always opposite each other. Okay? That's easy, right? All right? Much easier than what we had to do with that stupid equation. All right? Now, there's one other thing we need to know, and then we can easily explain what's going on in the lungs. What would happen if I take a balloon and I start forcing air into the balloon? The balloon blows up, right? Okay, the balloon blows up. As I blow up that balloon and force more and more air into it, what's happening to the pressure inside that balloon? It's going up a lot, right? So the pressure inside of a blown up balloon is really holding that balloon. Which way does the air want to go? From the high pressure inside of the balloon out or from the low pressure outside into the balloon? It goes out, right? We all know that. We've all seen that. But let's just make sure we understand what that means. That means air always flows. Air flows from the high pressure area to a low pressure area, always. So wherever the, pre the gas is going to flow to where that pressure is lower. So if you have a blown up balloon, the pressure of all the gases is high inside of the balloon. So if you open it up and give a way for that air to escape, the air is going to flow from the high pressure of the balloon out. Very, very similar. The only difference is that has a solid molecule component to it. So it's a little bit different physics, but it's, it's the same principle. Wherever you have more of something, it's going to go to where you have less of it. I mean, that's just, that's how whoever, yeah, it's common sense. That's how whoever you think designed the world did it, because that's the way pretty much everything works. Pretty much. There are a few weird exceptions. Okay? So we understand those two things. That's very simple, right? Air goes from high pressure to low pressure. If you increase the volume, you decrease the pressure. If you decrease the volume, you increase the pressure. Okay? So you all said that was easy. Let's make sure we can put it together. So what happens when we breathe in? Let's use what we just did. So if I go to breathe in, what's the first thing that has to happen for me to breathe? Do I just open my mouth and do nothing and the air just flows in? No. You stand in here a while, all right? What do I have to do? How do you inhale? Muscles, right? You got to use muscles to do that, okay? You have your diaphragm, which is that muscle directly underneath the rib cage, and you have intercoastal muscles, the muscles in between your ribs, okay? So the first thing that has to happen is your brain, even though you don't think about it, your brain sends the impulse to those skeletal muscles, and those muscles contract. When those muscles contract, what happens to the volume of your lungs? It expands. It gets bigger. How do we know that? What do we say? Put your hands right here. Contract those muscles. Your chest comes out because the volume of your lungs is going up. Okay? So if we, it's written on here, but we'll abbreviate it. So we contract our muscles. Then we increase the volume. Okay? If we increase the volume... We're increasing the pulmonary volume. 
Why can I abbreviate it like that? Because pulmonary at the bottom means what? The lungs. So if we contract our muscles, we're increasing the volume of our lungs. Right? Any time the volume goes up, what happens to the pressure? Goes down, right? Boyle told us that. Volume goes up, pressure goes down. So since we increase the pulmonary volume, we decrease the pulmonary pressure. Okay? So now we have a negative pulmonary pressure. Where is the pressure now lower? In our lungs or outside? What does negative mean? Less. Okay? So if inside is negative, right, we just decrease the, vo the pressure in our lungs, so now the pressure outside is higher than the pressure inside. Does everybody get that? I'll say it again. Okay? Muscles contract. That increases the volume in our lungs. If you increase the volume in your lungs, you decrease the pressure in your lungs. Now I have low pressure in my lungs, high pressure outside my body. Which way does air flow? From outside to in. From a high pressure outside to the low pressure inside. Okay? Sometimes it helps if I do this. Let's do it this way. Yeah, don't make fun of my... So here's my lungs. Kind of looks like lungs today. Better than it did yesterday. That is exactly the point I'm trying to make. Okay, hang on, let me make sure everybody can tell what I am attempting to draw. Okay, so we're just talking about an inspiration, breathing in. Okay, so step one, we contracted muscles. When we do that, we increase the volume down there in our lungs. Okay, if you increase the volume in your lungs, what does that do to the pressure? Makes the pressure go down. Okay. So now I have low pressure in my lungs. Air flows from high pressure to low pressure. So which way is the air going to flow? Into the lungs or out of the lungs? Understand that. This seems to be the point where I'm losing some of you. High volume, low pressure. If there's low pressure in the lungs, then air has to flow. Outside is higher. High ATM. So air has to flow in. Air flows from high pressure to low pressure. So Pam said exactly what I'm trying. Air doesn't come in because your lungs say, please come. Air comes into your body because your muscles make them bigger. And when you blow up those big balloons inside of your chest, which are your lungs, now you have a pressure difference. And since there's less pressure in your lungs, air's coming in. Since she's young, she will learn to adapt to the difference. Now, she may not ever be able to be a track star because she may not be able to change her volume enough that she can lower the pressure enough to get as large of a breath of air in as we can. Okay? Now, in lab, we did the spirometers, right? And we saw when we bent over, could we get as much air into our body? Do we understand why? If we bend over, we compress our lungs, right? So when we contract our muscles, can our lungs get as big? No. So these volumes and pressures are opposite, but the pressure can only go down as much as the volume goes up. So when we compressed, we couldn't get our lungs as big, so we couldn't lower the pressure, couldn't get as much air in. Now when we exercised and we got out of breath, we were then breathing harder because our muscles were contracting harder. When your muscle contracts harder, makes the volume in your lungs really, really big. If the volume is really high, the pressure is really low, so the air just flows like crazy into our lungs, and we can actually get more oxygen into our body. Okay? That's why if someone is 
unconscious, you're supposed to, like CPR, when you blow into their body, you're giving them CO2, right? We breathe out CO2. You're not breathing oxygen into their body. You breathe, you force an air into their lungs because you're forcing their lungs to increase in volume. So then when you move your mouth out the way, the air can naturally flow in. That's why you give somebody CPR. That's why you do that squeeze bag is to force their lungs to increase in volume, not to make their lungs go in and out. Okay? So are we learning something today? Yeah, it's a good day then. Good start. Let's go the other way. Okay, let's expire. Let's get it out. Okay, let's see if I can attempt to draw my same look. Weirdness. Oh, really fat lungs now. Nobody ever said that I thought I was good at this. Okay. So we're ready to breathe out. What have we already done? We have already contracted our muscles, made the volume go up, pressure go down. Large amount of air came in. So we've got a ton of air in our lungs now. And in order to breathe out, what do we do to those contracted muscles? We relax them. So now we relax our muscles. When we relax our muscles, what happens to the volume of our lungs? It decreases, right? If, if you don't believe me, breathe in. Watch what happens when you breathe out, right? Your chest physically gets smaller. So when you relax the muscles, you decrease the volume of your chest, which makes you decrease the volume in your lungs, okay? If I decrease the volume, down here in my lungs, what's that going to do to the pressure in my lungs? So that's going to make me increase the pressure of my lungs. Okay. So if I have a high pressure in my lungs and a lower pressure outside my body, which way is the air going to flow? To the outside. Does everybody understand that? Okay. If you have a high pressure in your lungs, pressure outside your body, air is going to flow out because the air is going to flow from the high pressure in the chest out to the lower pressure outside the body. Make sense? Do you understand why, even though we were all like, yeah, boy's law is easy, that makes sense. If he goes up, he goes down. They're opposites. Do you see why this gets tricky? You have to say it to yourself over and over and over again and really understand what's going on. Does everybody understand that? That's just how we get the air in, how we get the air out. We increase. If you want to summarize it, we change the volume. We use our muscles to change the volume. And then the pressure responds to the volume. Mm -hmm. In your own words, that helps. Yes. Always. It doesn't matter whether you start with volume or pressure. The other one's going to be the opposite. The way the lungs, the volume. We use our muscles to change the volume, and the pressure responds. We only control the volume. The pressure is just happening because we're changing the volume. Okay. So if we, have any of you guys ever been somewhere else in the country and tried to do something outside? You, I'm not talking about have you been to Montana hiking in the mountains. Have you been to Tennessee and tried to walk up one of those little cheesy trails to see the waterfall on top of it? You know what I'm talking about, right? Okay? You ever notice, man, I'm out of shape. Look how out of breath I am trying to do this. It's because you've changed altitude. It does not matter how good of, or how adept of an athlete you are, if you change in altitude, it's going to change your ability to breathe because you've changed the pressure outside your body. So it makes it harder for you to breathe. You've lowered the pressure outside your body. That's why a lot of your athletes will go somewhere else to train that is a higher altitude, lower pressure. That trains their lungs. So when they get somewhere like this at sea level, below sea level, they can really take in a lot of oxygen. Okay. All right, I'll let you guys read that. All right, so are we ready to move to the next thing? We understand how to breathe in and out. Now, we're going to do all of this again tomorrow, but for now, do we understand how to breathe in and out?
Okay. Now we've got to talk about how do we know which gas that we've just brought into our lungs to put into our blood. Okay, so that's kind of where we are now. We're going to assume we understand we took a huge breath full of air in. We did that by increasing the volume. We brought our air in. Okay, so now if I draw one of my great pictures, okay, so here's the alveoli, right? We're at the end of the lungs. We're assuming we're, we're getting the air in. We know how to do that, okay? Running right next to every alveoli is a capillary, right? Okay, so this is the alveoli. This is the blood. Now, let's, let's first let's do inspiration. First, let's breathe in. Okay? So we've just took a big deep breath in. That means inside of our lungs we have oxygen, we have CO2, we have hydrogen, we have sulfur gas, we have um, nitrogen. Okay, my, you know, I don't, you don't know all that. So my point is, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Because all we did was take what was in the air and pull it in. Now, are we going to use all of this? No. We only need the oxygen. So that's the only thing we want to go from the alveoli into the blood is the oxygen. We Guess what we do with all the rest of it? We breathe it back out. Okay, so the only thing we're worried about is how can our lungs know that I only want that oxygen and I want to pull it in to my blood, okay? What does the blood have in it? Blood only has two gases in it. No gases. What does the blood have in it? Gases. Oxygen and CO2, right? Okay. Now, it is at the point of the lungs. What does it have more of? Oxygen or CO2? CO2. Does everybody understand why? Why does the blood come to the lungs? To get oxygen, right? So obviously when it gets here, is it going to have oxygen? No, because then why would it be coming to get oxygen? So as the blood is flowing through here, the blood is full of CO2. Now it may have some oxygen in it but it's got more CO2 in it, okay? I'm trying to set up the scenario of what we've already talked about. We understand that this is kind of what it looks like right here, okay? Everybody's with me. We have to talk about one more guy to understand how we're going to pick and choose which gas we move, and his name is Dalton, okay? Dalton tells us that the pressure of a gas is related, okay, the pressure of an entire mixture is the sum of the pressures of each gas. Okay, so I'll explain why that matters in a second. What's important to us is he tells us it's directly proportional to the percentage in the mixture. Okay, let's put it in English. Right? Okay? The pressure is related to how much of it you have. If you have more of it, you have a higher pressure. Okay? So inside of our lungs, in this picture we drew right here, we have a good bit of oxygen. We have more oxygen than we do CO2. Okay, that's a little harder to understand here. Well, let's go to the blood. We understand that, right? What do you have a higher concentration of in your blood, the CO2 or the oxygen? The CO2. So Dalton tells us that in our blood, we have a high concentration of CO2. And Dalton says if you have a high concentration, you have a high pressure of CO2 in the blood. Okay. The other thing Dalton told us is that if you have a high pressure of CO2 right here, that's going to cause the entire pressure of the mixture to be driven by what's going on with the CO2. Okay. Again, in English, I got a lot of CO2 in the blood. That means I have a really high pressure of CO2 in my blood. Okay. I have a higher pressure of CO2 in my blood than I do in my alveoli. So in my alveoli, change colors where you guys can see it, I have a low 
concentration of CO2, which means I have a come on, low pressure of CO2. Now tell me again, which way does a gas flow from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure? So which way is this CO2 going to want to flow? It wants to go from high to low. Where's the pressure higher, in the blood or in the alveoli? In the blood. So the CO2 is going to go to the alveoli. Okay, we're going to say it again. But do you, are you starting to see how we're going to use pressure every time? But this time, we're not talking about volume. We're talking about how much of something we have. Okay? And it's directly proportional. So high concentration means high pressure, low concentration, low pressure. So let's start from the beginning. Okay? So I can get a few more of you to go, oh, I thought a few of you do. Okay? So as this blood is coming from my body, it's got a bunch of CO2 in it. Because that's the job that the blood has, is bringing that CO2 waste product to my lungs. Okay? So as the blood comes through here, it has way too much CO2 and it needs oxygen. Right? Okay? So since the blood's coming through here with a high concentration of CO2, Dalton tells us that he figured out if the concentration is high, the pressure is high. If the pressure of CO2 is high in the blood, that's going to mean it's going to flow from the blood to the area with less pressure, which is the alveoli. So the CO2 goes from the blood to the lungs. And then we can breathe out and kick it out of our body. Okay? We can do the same thing. Where do you have a low pressure of oxygen? Okay, I heard both answers. Let's take it a step further. Where do I have a low concentration of oxygen? In the blood, right? I have a low concentration of oxygen in the blood. If I have a low concentration of oxygen in my blood, what does that tell me about my pressure of oxygen in my blood? It's going to be low. So I have a low pressure of oxygen in my blood. Okay? In the lungs, I have a higher concentration of oxygen. So what does that tell me about the pressure of oxygen in my lungs? I have a high pressure of oxygen. Oxygen oops, sorry, it's up arrow. Oxygen flows from the area of high pressure of oxygen to the area of Low pressure of oxygen, so the oxygen is going to flow from the lung to the blood. Make sense? Now you should have a lot more respect for what happens every time you go, right? Every time you have breathed in and breathed out, your blood and your lungs, they did the math. They figured out where there was more of each one, so that meant the pressure was higher in one place, and they switched gases. Okay. That's exactly. When you put somebody on oxygen, you're giving them more oxygen. So how did you change then concentration in their lungs? If you increase the oxygen concentration, meaning more of the mixture is now oxygen. It forces more oxygen from your lungs into your blood. Mm -hmm. Well, and that thing is pure oxygen, and it's, it's, it's forcing it in. Whether you have good enough elastic or not, when they put you on the oxygen, they're forcing that oxygen in for you. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's under pressure. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it's forcing it into the lungs. Okay? Does this make sense? All right. I never know when to trust you. Uh, all right, we're going to do Henry's Law next time. Okay? We're going to skip a couple things. I'm going to go to another picture. We're, we're going to talk about everything, but I'm going to go to one other picture while we're, we're good and understanding something. I think I have this picture. I oh, know that's confusing. Let me just go back where we were. Sorry.
I just, I just need a blank sheet of paper. Let's just go for that. Sorry. You guys know how much I love drawing. Okay. So, let's use what we just did and let's go a little farther. Okay. Let's say we're going to follow that blood. Okay. From the lungs. Okay. I'm just expanding the picture we just drew. Okay, so what did this blood just get in the lungs? Oxygen. So it's got a lot of oxygen. Now we're going to review and make sure you understand that how's that oxygen being carried? By hemoglobin attached to the iron and the hemoglobin. So we're going to review that a little bit next time. But for now, okay, just, we're just doing this. Okay, got that oxygen floating through our blood. Okay, that oxygen is going to flow until it comes in contact with a cell in your body that needs oxygen. We all understand that, right? That's what our blood's doing. It's trying to deliver oxygen to the cells that need it. Why does that cell need oxygen? What does it use it for? To produce ATP. What is the waste product we make every time we're making ATP? CO2. So this cell right here, he has been spitting out CO2 like crazy. How do I know that? Well, because if he needs oxygen, that's because he's making ATP. If he's making ATP, I know he's making waste product. Do you guys see where I'm going with this? So how are we going to get the oxygen out of the blood and put it in our CO2 out of our cells and put it in our blood? Same thing we just did. Let's see if we can do it. Where's that higher concentration of oxygen? In the blood, we have a high concentration, let will just put a C, high concentration of oxygen. If we have a high concentration of oxygen in the blood, what does that tell us about the pressure? It's going to be a high pressure of oxygen, right? What is the concentration of oxygen in the cell, low or high? Low. How do we know that? Because we know it needs some oxygen. If we have a low concentration, what do we know about the pressure? We have a low pressure of oxygen. Oxygen flows from an area of high oxygen pressure to an area of low pressure. So which way is the oxygen going to go? From the blood to the cell. Very good. Do you understand how we did the same thing? All you have to do is sit down and think about where do I have more of which gas? Okay. Where do I have more CO2? Let's just be complete. In the cell. So in the cell, I have a high concentration of CO2, so that tells me I have a high pressure of CO2. In my blood, I have a low concentration of CO2, so that means I have a low pressure of CO2. CO2 flows from an area of high pressure of CO2 to an area of low pressure of CO2. So CO2 is going to flow into the blood. And now we've got CO2 in our blood. Where is this blood going to go? Back to the lungs. And now that we're back at the lungs, we'll have more CO2 in our blood. So that will be more pressure of CO2. So the CO2 is going to go to our lungs. Then if we want to get rid of it, we relax our muscles, decrease our volume, increase our pressure in our lungs, and it leaves. So what I want you guys to be able to do when you come Thursday is you should be able to close your eyes and think about, okay, first thing that happens, I contract my muscles. That increases the volume in my lungs. If I increase the volume, I decrease my pressure, air flows in. Now that air has flowed into my lungs, I have a high concentration of oxygen, so a low pressure. I want you to be able to follow it all the way through, which is what we did today in pieces. That's what I need you to do for me, because we still have quite a few pieces to do. We're not done today, but let me go ahead and kind of preview why you need to understand that to do the next part. How does the oxygen, we said oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, right? How does the hemoglobin know, oh, this is where we need to let go of the oxygen? 
And so we got to talk about how does it know that? Okay, and there's some little tricks to. So the last thing I want to do with you guys today, because I need you to look at this some before we continue too much, is let's review from chapter 17 how we carry the oxygen and the CO2 in our body. Okay? Now, you've already answered this for me. The major way we carry oxygen is bound to a molecule called hemoglobin. Right? Hemoglobin was that big four protein chain with the four hemes in it. The iron, the irons, right? So one hemoglobin carried how many oxygens? Four. Okay. So that's the number one way we carry oxygen. Oh. Now I would never ask you to write a chemical equation, but I put this up here to show something to you. Okay. Every time hemoglobin combines with oxygen, it becomes oxyhemoglobin. It oxidizes the hemoglobin, releases this H plus. Okay. I know you guys have it in chemistry, but we're going to have a very basic lesson right now. H plus is a proton. A proton. Okay. That is something that is very acidic. Acidic means low pH. Okay. Does anybody know what pH we want our blood to be? 7, which is acidic or basic? Neither. It's neutral. Okay? So if we were just constantly combining oxygen with hemoglobin, releasing this very acidic molecule, what would happen to the pH would go down, right? If we were constantly adding something acidic to our blood, our blood would turn acidic. That's called acidosis. That would kill you. So we have to have something to oppose this. So we need something that is high pH in our blood. And the low pH plus the high pH equals neutral. So to do this, to fix it, you guys can, we'll, we'll do some more of this. We're not skipping stuff, okay? We change the way we carry our CO2. Now, I know we briefly did this in Chapter 17. We're going to do it again, okay? We said that some CO2 does bind the hemoglobin on the chains, but that's really not the best way for us to carry CO2. Number one reason we need to make something basic to cancel out that whole acid thing going on with our hemoglobin. The other reason is we don't want the CO2 messing with the hemoglobin because we need the hemoglobin to carry the oxygen. Okay? So the major way we carry CO2 in our blood is we turn it into bicarbonate. Okay? Bicarbonate is abbreviated HCO3 minus. Does anybody remember what the acidic molecule was? The H plus. If the plus is acidic, what do you think the minus is? It's more alkaline. It's more basic. So this molecule is, which means high pH. Okay? Now, I don't want to get, I don't want to do too much chemistry. But if I don't tell you this, then the lingering question in your mind should be, what the hell do we keep changing stuff around for no reason? So you need to understand there is a reason that we're changing all this stuff instead of why not just carry the oxygen in our blood and the CO2? Why are we doing all this other stuff? Okay? So if I show you the equation, this happens in your red blood cells. I know I said this before, but it was a long time ago. This enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, is in your blood cells. It takes a carbon dioxide molecule, combines it with water, makes carbonic acid. This dissociates, which means separates, okay, in chemistry, and becomes our bicarbonate. Okay? Now, when you read your textbook, you will read that bicarbonate is a buffer. Okay? Well, if you know read chemistry, you know what the heck a buffer is. A buffer is a molecule that resists pH change. Okay? So every time one of your hemoglobin combines with oxygen and spits out that protein, we've got to have something to do with that. So your body takes one of those bicarbonates it made. How did it make that? It just used the CO2 that you just had floating around in your blood anyway. Those combine together, 
make H2CO3. Again, I don't want you to do too much chemistry, but if a plus is acidic, right here, the plus is acidic, and the minus is basic, do you see any charges on H2CO3? No, that one's not going to mess with your pH. Correct. Right. So every time you make one of those H pluses with the hemoglobin oxygen thing going on, you use one of these HCO3 minuses to basically just disguise it. Okay? It's like, right, plus 1 minus 1 equals 0 in math. If you like math that are in, they don't know chemistry. I, mean, I know you know math. Plus 1 minus 1 equals 0. Cancel each other out. Okay? So if we go back and we look at our little picture that I drew, the, where this comes into play is this oxygen is actually bound to hemoglobin. Right? And every time we combine an oxygen with hemoglobin, we release the proton, that H+. Plus. Well, we've got to have something to do with all those H+. Pluses. So every time one of these CO2s jumps into our blood, we turn it into the negative, the bicarbonate. The H, the bicarbonate floating around in our blood, we can use it to cancel out that proton. And then whenever lungs, we just switch it back to CO2 and then get rid of it. So we're basically using CO2 for something good on the pathway of trying to get it to our lungs where we're just going to spit it out. Okay? Did that confuse you guys? you understand? I know it's a lot. We're going to do it again. When you first get to class tomorrow, not tomorrow, Wednesday, see, we've actually gone over everything in the chapter except a few little bitty details. But I think we need to do all of the big stuff before we do the details.